Citizen Soldier. In the United States, the citizen soldier has a profound and cherished meaning, a meaning that goes back to well before our nation was founded. Our National Guard can trace its beginning back to 1636, when the first militia units were established in Massachusetts. Here, in North Carolina, we can trace the National Guard back to the 1660s, when colonial settlers were required to own a musket, powder, and shot in order to claim and protect land grants. In 1663, North Carolina Governor Samuel Stevens was ordered to train companies of soldiers to protect colonists from those Indian tribes that were hostile and other European nations. The fundamental constitutions of Carolina in 1669 went further and required men from ages 17 to 60 to be available if called upon to serve as militia. Militia, in historic terms, means citizens serving as part-time soldiers for their colony or state when needed. Our citizen soldiers, then and now, reflect the core values of the North Carolina National Guard. Loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, personal courage, and excellence. In this short video, you will see three events from North Carolina's early history. The Tuscarora War, the story of James Innes, and the Stamp Act Rebellion. Think about these in the context of values. Would you have what it takes to do what these early citizens did? Did you know that Samuel Stevens was the first governor of any colony? Not born in England, but rather born in America. As these colonial citizen soldiers went about their daily chores, they were ever ready if needed, and needed they would be. Unfortunately for the Native Americans in North Carolina, the colonists kept a suspicious eye on them, especially in Bath County, now Beaufort County, where the Tuscarora Indians resided. As settlers moved into the area, and then up the Pamlico and Neuse Rivers, the Tuscarora viewed them with resentment and fear for they were overrunning prime hunting grounds and taking the best village sites for their towns. North Carolina historian Ben Sorensen picks up the story here. Here we are at the Katechna Indian Village in Grifton, North Carolina. Now, we're not sure where this Tuscarora settlement was, but this site is our best guess. John Lawson, a North Carolina explorer, historian, writer, and adventurer, described this village in his book, a New Voyage to Carolina, published in 1709. The Tuscarora were a powerful tribe, closely related to the Iroquois of New York. These tribes began to harass the settlers. They made threats, stole hogs, but overall these conflicts did not result in any horrendous attacks. Most tribes, however, were not in any position to really attack the settlers. They did, though, assault one. John Lawson arrived in Charleston, South Carolina in 1700, and later that same year, he began to explore the Carolina backcountry. After traveling over 600 miles in the wilderness, he wound up near the mouth of the Pamlico River, where he settled. Lawson was the founder of Bath, and interestingly enough, also donated some of the land for the town. Here we are in historic Bath in Beaufort County, North Carolina. This was the earliest port of entry, soon it became a trading town, and was also our very first capital. You might have heard of Edward Teach, or Blackbeard the Pirate. He settled in this town for a short time before returning to his pirate ways. Lawson and another colonist decided to explore the Noose River Basin, which led them right into the Tuscarora settlements. In September of 1711, he and his associate were captured while traveling the Noose River. They were questioned by the Native Americans, who were not pleased with their responses. Held overnight, another chief from the Koree tribe arrived and demanded to question the prisoners. A heated argument ensued with the chief. Lawson's companion was released, but Lawson was tortured and executed. This execution lent momentum to the Tuscarora's desire to push the white settlers out. 
Just about 10 days after the execution, on September 22, 1711, the Tuscarora warriors, armed with guns and tomahawks, attacked. Their main attacks were along Roanoke, Noose, and Trent Rivers, and the city of Bath. The Native Americans were relentless. They impaled and mutilated the bodies of their victims. Overall, the Tuscarora killed about 130 people and took 20 to 30 prisoners. The white settlers were taken completely by surprise. Governor Edward Hyde asked Major General of the Militia, Thomas Pollock, to raise a 150-man militia to fight the Indians. They joined Captain William Bryce's 60-man militia at Bath. William Bryce was a complex man. As one historian tells us, In many ways, a rascal, a scoundrel, a hard and brutal man. Nevertheless, he embodied traits found in just about every English colonist in North Carolina who tried every and any way to get ahead. Pollock gave the orders to move out against the Indians. And oddly, only William Bryce's men moved out who were stationed here in Bath. The militia that Pollock raised refused to go. Now, William Bryce's 60-man militia ran into 300 Tuscarora warriors. And of course, they were forced to move back to the Trent River. The militia could not move forward. Bryce had to wait for assistance from other colonies. Now, Virginia talked about sending men, but not a man came. Instead, they sent gunpowder and cloth, but without men, those supplies are of little help. But help is going to come from South Carolina. Captain John Barnwell of South Carolina arrived with a militia force of 33 settlers and 495 Yamasee Indians. They fought through the heart of Tuscarora country, burning villages and Indian towns along the way. On February 6, 1712, Barnwell made it to the Pamlico River. He asked the town of Bath if he could station his militia there, and Bath agreed. His men arrived there on February 10th. Captain Barnwell picked up almost 70 North Carolinians to join the push and made his move to attack. He surrounded the Tuscarora Fort on April 7th and besieged it for 10 days. The Indians asked for peace, and Captain Barnwell provided very generous terms. The war seemed to be over, but it wasn't. North Carolina officials under Governor Hyde hated the terms and were upset with Barnwell. They believed he should have destroyed the Tuscarora. They did not give him thanks, rather they censured him. A very upset Captain Barnwell took some of his Indian prisoners as slaves and returned to South Carolina. On September 8, 1712, Governor Edward Hyde died of yellow fever in Bertie County, making Thomas Pollock the new governor. Pollock renewed the push against the Tuscarora, making sure Bath and the surrounding area had powder, weapons, and other supplies. Three years later, on February 11, 1715, the Tuscarora and other smaller Indian tribes signed a peace treaty with the North Carolina government. They agreed to settle on a reservation in Hyde County near Lake Matamesquite. The citizen soldiers of North Carolina succeeded in protecting their settlements with limited help from other colonies. The horrible devastation of the Tuscarora War forced the authorities here in North Carolina to recognize the need to reorganize and reinvigorate the colony's militia. In 1715, the Colonial Assembly enacted legislation that served as the foundation from the militia citizen soldier until the American Revolution. The preamble said, The safety of this, as well as all other well-governed colonies, greatly depends upon well-regulating the militia thereof. Sound familiar? It's the same concept as the Second Amendment to the U.S. Constitution that will be adopted 76 years later. Okay, heads up. Here's something to think about. Which of the following groups refused to serve in the militia? A. Scots-Irish B. Quakers C. Germans Well, the answer is B. The Quakers refused service in the militia due to their religious beliefs.
There are occasions when our part-time warriors are needed outside the state, or in the case of Captain James Innes, outside the colony. Scottish-born, James Innes is an excellent example of one of our North Carolina citizen soldiers. Innes came to North Carolina in 1733. Seven years later, he was placed in command of the Cape Fear Company of Militia as part of a British expedition to South America to fight against the Spanish. Captain Innes would not return to North Carolina for two years. Innes and his men were quartered on British naval vessels under extremely harsh conditions. On February 7th, 1742, the officers of the regiment formally complained about the conditions. Whose name was first on the paper? Captain James Innes. One year later, Innes and the surviving 24 men of the Cape Fear Company finally arrived back in North Carolina. He was anxious to return to his planter life, yet still wanted to serve his colony and was appointed Colonel of the new Hanover County Militia. By the 1750s, trouble was brewing with the French, west of the Appalachian Mountains, and the colony of North Carolina agreed to fund a force of 750 men to assist Virginia Governor Robert Dinwiddie and his expedition. Evidently, fellow Scott, Governor Dinwiddie and Innes were previously acquainted, so Dinwiddie was enthusiastic when he learned of the appointment of Innes to command the North Carolina contingent. The governor greatly admired his judgment and cool conduct under pressure. When the expedition's commander died during the forced march to Ohio, Governor Dinwiddie appointed Innes commander over our future first president, George Washington, who was second in command of the force. The humble Washington wrote to the governor, I rejoice that I am likely to be happy under the command of an experienced officer and man of sense. These initial skirmishes of Washington with the French marked the beginning of the Seven Years' War, known in the colonies as the French and Indian War. As for Innes and his North Carolinians, well, they didn't receive the food and money they were promised and disbanded. However, Innes chose to remain in command of the expedition and was ordered to take a meager force to Wills Creek, Maryland, where he renamed the post Fort Cumberland. Colonel Innes remained in command there, off and on, until the summer of 1756, when he returned to his plantation on the northeast branch of the Cape Fear River, not too far from Wilmington. James Innes was one of the most important men of his time. Respected by all who knew him, he was honorable and honest, and is one of the many unsung heroes that served this state as a citizen soldier. Did you know that James Innes's will, upon the death of his wife, ordered his considerable personal property, land, and library to be used to establish Innes Academy, a free school for North Carolina children? This was the first private behest for education in North Carolina history. Here we are at the Wilmington residence of William Tryon. It was here that on October 19th in 1765, at about seven o'clock in the evening, 500 residents gathered together carrying an effigy of an honorable gentleman. That honorable gentleman we think was William Houston, the tax collector. They hang the effigy by the neck for several hours while they created a large bonfire of pitch and tar barrels. Then they took the effigy down and cast it into the flames. What would cause the good people of Wilmington to take such a course of action? Stamps. Stamps. And, of course, taxation without proper representation. For much of our history, the British Crown had neglected to enforce numerous trade laws, allowing the colonies to do pretty much as they pleased. That all ended after the French and Indian War. The British government passed a series of navigation acts and even some additional taxes in an attempt to get a firmer control over its colonies and to help pay for the war. Part of the British plan was to place a military force in the colonies, and use a small tax to help pay for it. This tax on public papers, such as newspapers, pamphlets, 
insurance policies, ship's papers, playing cards, and legal documents required a stamp to prove the tax had been paid. On October 31st, 1765, a group of incensed Wilmingtonians actually held a mock funeral for liberty the day before the Stamp Act went into effect. We're at St. Philip's Church in Brunswick Town. Now imagine it's Halloween in 1765. The townspeople have an effigy of liberty in a casket and are parading it through this cemetery. As they're about to lower it into the ground, one of the townspeople walks up and takes his arm and lifts it, checking for vital signs, and says, there is life in her yet. Lady Liberty still lives. Imagine the HMS Diligence slowly sailing up the Cape Fear River and docking here. On board, the hated stamps of the stamp tax. Now the resistance to the stamp tax just kept growing and growing. And on November 28th, 1765, the diligence landed here with those hated stamps. The people did not want the stamps to come on shore. And even William Tryon, the royal governor and personal representative to the king himself, offered to personally pay for those stamps. But the people of Brunswick wouldn't have this. Out of principle, they would not allow those stamps to be disembarked. The next February, our citizen soldiers became incensed when two merchant ships were seized by the British Navy for not having the proper stamps on their clearance papers. On February 12, 1766, the North Carolina Gazette published a letter under the pseudonym Philanthropos about the crisis. The letter sounds very similar to the famous Patrick Henry speech, Give me liberty or give me death, delivered almost one year before. Where now is your late boasted courage and resolution? Have the Wilmotonians, Brunswickers, and New Hanoverians lost their senses and their souls? And are they determined tamely to submit to slavery? Liberty calls you, dear liberty. A week after this letter was published, Citizen John Ash and Colonel Hugh Waddell led a militia from Wilmington and garrisoned here at Fort Johnston in modern-day Southport at the mouth of the Cape Fear River. Here, they forced the release of the two seized ships. This is Russellboro, the residence of the royal governor at Brunswick Town. At first, it was Castle Dobbs, then Castle Tryon for William Tryon, before he built Tryon's palace in Newburn. Cornelius Harnett, a merchant, a statesman, and a member of the Sons of Liberty, led a militia and surrounded this house. They effectively placed the royal governor under house arrest. They demanded that William Pennington, the collector of the stamp tax, resign. This house was surrounded by 580 armed men along with 100 unarmed men. William Pennington did in fact resign and promised to never issue a piece of stamped paper in this province. This happened eight years before the Boston Tea Party. And because of this insurrection, North Carolina never paid a single shilling in stamp tax. Cornelius Harnett would go on to be a prominent politician and statesman in North Carolina. He was directly involved with the planning for the Battle of Moores Creek, as well as the writing and passing of the Halifax Resolves in April 1776. This is the cemetery at St. James Church in Wilmington, North Carolina. Here is the grave of Cornelius Harnett. Cornelius Harnett was known as the Sam Adams of the South, and when British General Cornwallis came into Wilmington, he captured Cornelius Harnett beat him and drug him through the streets of Wilmington and then threw him in prison. When Cornelius Harnett was released from prison, his body was so badly beaten that he died only a couple of weeks later. Colonel Hugh Waddell was also a very well-known militia leader. 
He led a militia unit in the French and Indian War while serving under Colonel James Innes. He supervised the construction of Fort Dobbs near Statesville. His scouting force, known as Rangers, were one of the precursors of today's U.S. Army Rangers. Waddell was instrumental in establishing the Sons of Liberty in North Carolina around Wilmington and was active through the pre-revolutionary era. Unfortunately, he became ill and died in 1773, never seeing a free North Carolina nor a United States. As a result of civilian protests and the actions of our citizen soldiers of the militia like Cornelius Harnett and Hugh Waddell, the Stamp Act of 1765 was repealed just one year later. Okay, here's another heads up question. What upset the colonists most about the stamp tax? A, the amount of the tax. B, being taxed without any representatives in the British Parliament. And C, having to go to the closest town to get the stamp. You all remember the phrase, no taxation without representation. Well, that makes the obvious answer B. We had no representatives in the British Parliament. Well, that's about it. As you can see in these three examples, our early founders stood up for what they believed to be their rights and dealt with threats to their freedoms. At times, their service caused them to travel far outside the colony by land and sea and, when necessary, sacrifice their lives for North Carolina. These brave citizen soldiers helped to establish the foundation of today's North Carolina National Guard and assisted in establishing our core values and freedoms.